Hello, welcome back. I'm Statman Dave. Today we're going to be looking at one fix for your Premier League team. Men to subscribe if you're new, smash that like button. But anyway, let's get this party started. With the transfer window shut and the squad's finalised for the 2021-22 season, I'm going to go through every Premier League's team priority fix that they need to do to progress come the end of the season. Starting with the bottom of the table, it's hard to ask more of Sean Dyche and Burnley. Staying in the Premier League for six seasons despite operating on a shoestring budget is more than anyone at Burnley could have hoped for. And if they can stay up this season, I think Dyche needs a statue building outside of Turf Moor. The next step for Dyche's Burnley, however, could come with a switch in tactics to a 3-5-2. This shape still allows for a wing play style that's become synonymous with Dyche and Burnley, and it would allow new signing Veghorst to play alongside Max Cornet and explosive front three. The shape isn't too different from the 4-4-2, except with an extra midfielder could help make Burnley even more difficult to play against. Dwight McNeil definitely has the skill set to play at wing back, whilst Connor Roberts thrived from that position last season with only Emi Bundia creating more chances than the Welsh international in the 2021 championship season. This tweaked Burnley setup could provide the extra solidity they need to bridge the four point gap to safety, whilst their old shape with an extra forward is always available if they need a goal. At Newcastle United, their rebuild is very much underway and all that Eddie Howe needs to do is integrate his new signings so the Geordies can stay in the Premier League. Bruno Guimaraes will massively improve the quality of Newcastle's play increasing the possession game the Magpies play, whilst adding a defensive tenacity of ball winning in midfield. Getting the very best out of the Brazilian has to be paramount. Integrating the new signings would also give Howe a roadmap for the summer and allow Newcastle to identify where their next marquee signings are needed. At Watford there needs to be a major rethink when it comes to the approach to managers. Instead of sacking a manager every time it starts to go badly, Watford need to strap in for the long haul and start a project that could establish the Hornets as a Premier League club. Roy Hodgson might not be the guy, but Watford need to look past this season and decide what kind of football they want to play and which managers can they approach to deliver it. Chris Wilder would have been the appointment, but he's transforming Middlesbrough. Nuno Espirito Santo or Jesse Marsh would be coups for the Hornets, but what they should be looking at is a manager that will revolutionise the club through good coaching and in bringing in stability to Watford Football Club. And moving on, Dean Smith needs to give more minutes to talented youngsters at Carrow Road. Whilst Norwich are on a really good run of form, extrapolating points per game for the season suggests that the Canaries will only finish one point ahead of newly strengthened Newcastle, so that can't guarantee safety. But giving more minutes to the likes of Adam Eder and Josh Sargent, who've scored the winners in Norwich's last two league wins, won't just give them the best chance of survival this season, but it will put them in a good position to gain promotion from the Championship if they get relegated this time around, as their core of young, talented players will get experience in the top division before crushing the championship. For the rest of the season, Everton will want to stabilise under Frank Lampard and establish a system that they can work with right now, but then improve on in the summer. Lampard deployed a 3-4-3 in his first game as Everton boss, and this shape makes a lot of sense for all parties. Some of Lampard's best performances as Chelsea manager came in a 3-4-3. Meanwhile, at Everton, the shape hides some of the problems in the squad. Obviously, the squad has players from different regimes that don't fit one particular style of play, but this shape has a lot of high hybrid roles, with midfielders able to play at centre-back, wingers at wing-back and number 10s in central midfield, providing the balance is right. But in terms of quality, Everton's centre-backs often get exposed in a back four, but playing in a back five can reduce this. And with the width coming from the wing backs, it allows Lampard to play a fluid front three, or he can get in both of his shadow striker winter signings into the same starting 11. Over at Leeds United, I think Bielsa is in need of a mini rebuild. Rafinha is too good to be involved in a relegation battle and will likely leave in the summer, whilst Patrick Bamford has massively struggled with injuries. In fact, as of the 7th of February, with an update on the striker, Bamford has not improved. He continues with problems at the bottom of his foot and he's not started jogging, so his situation continues the same way. 
Last season, Bamford played all 38 matches, but he's only managed five starts in this campaign, with a series of different injuries. Bielsa needs to start preparing for life without his star attackers, giving Joe Gerhardt the rest of the season to develop into a starting number nine and increasing the attacking responsibility on Jack Harrison, who's been scoring a goal per game in 2022. Moving on, and Thomas Frank's Brentford need to get Ivan Tony scoring again. It was Tony's 33 goals that fired the Bees to promotion last season. And whilst his creativity and link play has been good, strike partner Brian and Bermo isn't the same finisher as Tony. A tweak in tactics to get Tony playing on the last line could see Brentford scoring more goals. However, signing Christian Eriksson on the free is a great bit of business that could solve the problem for Frank, providing he doesn't overuse the Dane. Eriksson could force a switch to a 3-4-1-2, which will reduce Tony's space to operate in when dropping off the line and could naturally force the striker to play up against the last line. Alternatively, a 3-4-2-1 could get Ericsson and Bermo deeper. With the Dane pulling the strings and using Tony's link play to create space for and Bermo to run in behind. But with an extra forward, we could see better support play and less shooting from the Frenchman. Over at Crystal Palace, Patrick Vieira has to work Alisse, Eze and Zaha into his starting 11. The trio could form a devastating front three that could cause trouble for the very best sides. 4-3-3 could facilitate this and still give Conor Gallagher his attacking box-to-box -box role, all while still suiting Vieira's possession-based style that has lit up Sellers part this season. It would also suit the Eagles squad, who now have got genuine quality in depth in those attacking wide positions. Palace will also be losing one of the best players, Conor Gallagher, next season, who will be returning to Chelsea after his loan spell, and developing chemistry between the front three positions could make this absence less of a problem. At Southampton, Ralph Hassan Hootel needs to make Amando Brogia his first choice striker. The Albanian international is Southampton's top scorer from open play this season despite playing less than 50% of the minutes available. Making him first choice won't just be playing the best goal scorer at the club, but it could also convince Brogia to make his loan a permanent move so he can continue developing playing week in week out. Southampton have been struggling for goals since they lost Danny Ings, but Amando Brogia could be their new goal scoring number nine. Next, Steven Gerrard's Aston Aston Villa. They need to establish who their best centre forward is, Danny Ings or Ollie Watkins. Watkins is better for the team, he presses harder, brings teammates into play, which make Villa a better unit. Ings on the other hand is a better goal scorer, and he showed this during his days at Southampton where he fired the side up the table through his goal getting. Gerrard's 4-3-2-1 and the squad that he's assembled with the likes of Emi Bundir, Philip Coutinho and Luca Dean create the chances suggesting that Ings will be the main striker but if Watkins can become as prolific as the Bournemouth Academy graduate, then Villa will be much better for it. A game-by-game -game rotation would be smart, fielding Watkins against the very best sides, Danny Ings against the middling teams, and using both of them with Ings as an interior against a relegation fodder. This would give both players the chance to stake a claim to be the starting striker role, and the competition could fire Villa into an unlikely finish in the European places. Leicester City, meanwhile, need to solve their defensive problems. Only four teams in the Premier League this season have a greater XG against, and Leicester City's expected points has them down in 15th position. Switching to a 3-4-1-2 and getting in an extra defender could help with this, but I think the problems run deeper than the shape, and it may be a coming-to-the-end situation for Brendan Rodgers. It's pretty clear that he doesn't know what his best 11 is, and the squad building has been a little bit questionable. Patterson Dakar is averaging a goal or assist every 65 minutes in the Premier League this season, but has started just four times, whilst Vestergaard and Bertrand have managed just over 900 minutes between them. It feels very similar to the end of his days at Liverpool, where Rodgers had taken his side as far as he could, but didn't know what to do next. So I think if Leicester City seriously want to break into the top six, then preparing a succession plan should be the aim for the rest of the season, perhaps trying to snatch Graham Potter from Brighton if Rodgers continues to flounder. Brighton simply have to keep giving faith in Graham Potter and allowing the coach to continue progressing his team. On course for their best ever Premier League season under Potter, Brighton are finally starting to pick up the points that their performances have warranted. Tactically excellent and capable of playing their progressive possession-based style in a number of different shapes, perhaps making a back four their preferred system is the next step for the Seagulls. Although still underperforming their XG and their expected points by far less than last season, the extra attacking output with one less defender could create 
create the extra chances that they need to win matches. It could also allow Potter to move Neil Mope to the left wing and use Leandro Trossard as a false nine, creating an inverted front three like Liverpool and Man City use, the best two coach sides in the country. Next up, Wolverhampton Wanderers. Wolves fans, we owe you an apology. We forgot you in the one transfer video. I'm sorry, we won't do it again, but means that you get two this time. Before the end of the season, Bruno Large needs to add a bit of creativity and clinical finishing to his side. Only four sides have managed to generate less expected goals in the Premier League than Wolves this season. Whilst they're overperforming their XG against my more than double anyone else in the competition. Simply put, their results are unsustainable. So something needs to change before it's too late. A switch to a 4-3-3 or a 4-2-3-1 could be a quick fix. By introducing an extra midfielder and throwing away one of those defenders, Large could free up Moutinho and Neves, Wolves' third and fourth best shot creators in the squad, to play in more creative roles, whilst increasing their defensive solidity, meaning they rely less on Saar to keep the ball out of the back of the net. The 4-2-3-1 could also allow Large to use Fabio Silvermore, who scored more Premier League goals per 90 than any other Wolves player last season. Large used Jao Felix in a similar second striker role at Benfica, and at Wolves it could take the pressure off Raul Jimenez to lead the line after he's returned from that terrible injury. A 4-3-3 with two free eights or a 4-2-3-1 could also create space for a new signing. Wolves' midfield of Neves and Moutinho is hardworking and great in possession, but they're hardly the final third creators that Wolves need. Jose Mua would be a fantastic addition, or Seiko Fofana would replace some of Adama Traore's direct dribbling, whilst Renato Sanchez would be the board's ideal Portuguese addition. At Spurs, it's pretty simple. They've got to back Antonio Conte. Without doubt, Conte is one of the very best managers in the world, and if it doesn't work with the Italian, they won't get a manager anywhere near his level, so Spurs need to keep him happy by buying his transfer targets. Spurs have picked up the third most points in the Premier League since Conte's first game as manager, so he's doing his part. Daniel Levy has to do the same. Bentaker and Kulisevsky are excellent first additions, but they need to see more as Conte can provide Spurs their last hope of success with this group of players. Mikel Arteta's Arsenal need to try Gabriel Martinelli as a striker. With the departure of Aubameyang and no January reinforcements, Lacazette is the only senior striker in the Arsenal squad, with Eddie Nketiah playing a total of 51 Premier League minutes prior to February. The January business seems like the Arsenal board have accepted that this season is a bit of a write-off, so Arteta needs to establish whether Martinelli is going to be a winger or a striker. Although his goal return in an Arsenal shirt suggests the former, with the Brazilians scoring seven goals in just 12 appearances up front for the Gunners. In the meantime, it also allows Emil Smith Rowe to return to the starting 11 on the left flank. And if Martinelli really doesn't work up front, then Arsenal can go into the summer transfer window knowing whether they need a new number nine. At West Ham, David Moyes needs to prioritise Silverware to convince his stars to stick around. There's no secret that Jared Bowen and Declan Rice are attracting interest from Champions League clubs. So when the FA Cup or the Europa League could convince them to stay for at least one more season whilst the club sorts out replacements. On their day, Moyes' West Ham can be anyone left in the FA Cup or Europa League, with the defensive solidity provided by Rice and Suchek, the intensity and brilliance of Ben Rama, Bowen, Fornells and Antonio, and a set-piece threat that's up there with the best in the world. Next up, Manchester United need to sort out a succession plan. According to reports, United rejected multiple transfers in January because they're waiting to see who their next manager is, which is fine. It's better to wait for the right players for the next manager than waste money. But United have to get their business done early. Ralph Randnick is doing a decent job, but his progress highlights the rebuild needed at Old Trafford. Whether the next permanent manager is going to be Luis Enrique, Maurizio Pochettino, Eric Ten Hag, or anyone else, it's imperative that they join as soon as the season ends so they get a full pre-season to implement their ideas and whilst the club needs to start the successor Randnick needs to focus on returning Marcus Rashford to form and giving Jade and Sancho Premier League minutes but also sticking to a 4-3-3 which I think the next manager will come in and use. Over at Chelsea Thomas Tuchel has had a bad time with injuries. 
losing the two most important players in his system in Rhys James and Ben Chilwell. The wing backs in the German shape offer a lot of mobility and dynamism, and there's no coincidence that Chelsea's bad run of form has coincided with the loss of the duo. In fact, Chelsea have only won four of their 12 Premier League games without Chilwell, and they've won just once of their last four without both wing backs. Tuchel either needs to give opportunities to their young wing backs in their incredible academy. Dion Rankin is a similar right sided player to Tyreek Lamptey, small but a very dynamic individual. Harvey Vale is an attacking midfielder who's been in Chelsea's first team this season and has played left wing back in the UEFA Youth League. While Silco Thomas has been their main left wing back, contributing four goal involvements in just five UEFA Youth appearances this season. We've seen a number of Chelsea's Premier League graduates make an immediate transition to Premier League football with wing backs Tarek Lamptey and Tino Liveramento, the latest to do so. However, playing for Chelsea is a different beast. So if the youngsters aren't ready to challenge, then continuing with the 4-3-3 until both wing backs are fit would be smart. Mason Mount has thrived in a free role in that three man midfield and has linked very well with Hakim Ziyech on the right wing, whilst Callum hudson Adoy is making it hard to leave him out with his recent form from the left hand side. Sorting out his wing back problems, especially with such drop off in quality in terms of the backups is a major priority for Thomas Tuchel's Chelsea. Liverpool meanwhile have very little to fix. The addition of Luis Diaz for £40 million is another great bit of business. The only thing that they need to fix is their contract situation with Mohamed Salah, but with Diaz, Jota and Elliot and most likely Fabio Carvalho in the summer, Liverpool have already assembled the next generation. So in terms of Salah, I think Liverpool should maybe walk away. He might be the best player in the world right now with only Messi and Ronaldo having maintained that status for a prolonged period of time but giving him a bumper contract to an aging forward hasn't worked well in the Premier League just asked Arsenal with a Bemiang. Whilst it's hard Liverpool have been a fantastically well-run club and have a wage structure that's protected the financial help of the institution whilst they've won trophies. All Liverpool need to do by the end of the season is integrate Luis Diaz as his talent will have an impact on the latter stage of the Premier League and Champions League. And finally at Manchester City it's a similar story to title rivals Liverpool where there's very little to fix but integrating and getting the best out of Jack Grealish will improve their chances of silverware. With just four goal involvements in his first 16 Premier League appearances for Man City, Grealish has started slowly, but his talents can win matches on his own and could be the X factor for the club to finally win their first Champions League title. But Grealish needs to be informed. After six months of learning Pep's system, Grealish might have finally been trusted by Guardiola. And if recent performances against Fulham is a sign of things to come, Man City might have found the number nine. Grealish took more shots and completed more dribbles than anyone else on the pitch, whilst only Kevin De Bruyne created more chances and only John Stones won more tackles. But anyway, guys, what do you think? What does your team need to fix before the end of the season? Let me know in the comments below i've been statman dave subscribe if you're new we'll see you later thanks for watching if you've enjoyed this video why not check out some more content on the statman dave youtube channel